Well, good morning. Again, again. Uh, before I get into my message in Romans 8, uh, we're going to be looking at verses 31 to 39 today. Before I do that, um, I want to I just share a brief update about Brother, uh, Brother Bill, if that's okay, Miss Barry. Uh, Brother Bill is uh, now in a rehab facility in the land, and uh, it, he's currently getting some rehab, but because of his COVID status, he's kind of limited right now. So uh, he's uh, going to be continually tested until... Uh, I guess he's negative, and then they'll, then his therapy will start changing. But uh, I do want to ask that you would continue praying for him. If you're if you know Brother Bill, then you know that he's probably ready to come home. Ten minutes ago, yes. an hour ago, and he's uh, he's antsy and uh, not being able to see his family right now. Nobody can see him because of COVID, and so uh, this is real frustrating for him and the family. And so y'all continue uh, praying for Barry. Uh, because this is, she's she's carrying the load this week. I'm praying for Bill as he gets he as he heals, and that uh, God will give him patience as he works through his therapy. Uh, he he needs he needs praise. He, he's doing better every day, but uh, this is a this, uh, this is a this is a long road. So y'all pray for him and the family. And uh, but I'm going to be sharing some information and put it on the bulletin board, probably through an email of how you can contact him if you'd like to send a get well card. Uh, like any encouragement card, if you want to call him or text him, I believe he can do that. There's going to be a number there where you can reach him. We're going to be putting that on the bulletin board. It's going to be up there this week. And if I have your email address, you're going to be getting that by email. So uh, it, he needs all the prayers and encouragement he can get. And so uh, uh, y'all uh, y'all just continue praying for the family because uh, uh, this is a real challenge for them. God's going to take care of them, though. Amen. God's in control, always has been in control, and will continue to be in control because that's who our God is. Romans 8, if you've already found your place and your copy of God's Word, and chapter 8, verse 31 and 39, this is some good stuff, folks. This is good stuff. Apostle Paul, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who's against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How we will not also with him grant us everything. Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who's the one that condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you we were put to being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Heavenly Father, today, Lord, as we take a look at this magnificent passage of Scripture, Father, I pray today that you would help us to hear what you have for us. Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, and many of us are easily distracted, and I pray that you'd help us to focus our eyes on you today, Lord, that, Lord, whatever we came in the door with today, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to just simply drop it at your feet and just look at look to you. Father God, uh, we've come today, Father, and, and we, we want to spend some time with you and hear what you've got to say. So, Father God, I pray that you would speak through me today, Father, that your words would come out, and Father, we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but Father, also doers of the word. Father God, this is your time. These are your people. And Father, we are committed to it. Father, we commit this time to you. Father, we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been in chapter 8 for a little bit. Today we wrap up. All of chapter 8 has been leading up to this particular set of scripture. If this was a song, if chapter 8 was a song, chapter, chapter 8, verse 31 and 39 would be what they call the grand finale. It would be the, the big one. If you've never, if you ever watched fireworks when the cities put off the fireworks, there's always what they put at the end, what they call the grand finale, right? You know what the grand finale is, right? Where they're wrapping everything up and everything that they have left, they're lighting. Okay? Every single thing, they're just torching it. And if you've been, if you've seen the city of Port Orange's fireworks or some of these others, the grand finale is really it's the best part of the whole show. 
I mean, it's just ongoing. It's just boom, 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 boom. It's nonstop, nonstop. It is the best part. It's ending with a bang, literally. And chapter 8, in here, <laughs> chapter 8, verse 31 to 39, is literally the grand finale of the entire the entirety of the chapter. It is the what we've all been waiting for. It is the ooh, the ah, the moment. It is everything. Paul has been making his argument throughout the entire chapter that God's love has set us free from sin's condemnation. We saw that earlier. God's love has set us free from the condemnation of sin. Amen to that, right? He set us free. The Spirit, God's Spirit, now lives in us, and he is focused on that, and we have been adopted into God's family. And can I get an amen on that? We've been adopted into the family of God. And the proof of that is the Holy Spirit's presence. Amen? He is in our lives. God hears our prayers. We see this in chapter 8. He hears our prayers, even if we don't know how to pray. And God works everything out for our good, no matter what it is. We actually looked at that last week. God works all things for the good for what those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. God's always doing good and working for the good for his people. Amen? Good from his perspective. Doesn't always look good from ours. But today he ends chapter 8 reminding us that God loves us no matter what and nothing will get in his way of loving us. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Nothing gets between us and him. So let's take a look at it. Over here in chapter 8, let's look at the first couple of verses. The Apostle Paul, literally this whole passage is talking about our victory in Jesus. See. He says, what shall we say about these things? And, 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 we, and we see in these things that this is what all Paul's been talking about in chapter 3. He begins to ask a series of questions throughout this entire section. All right, There's more than three, but we're looking at three main questions in this chapter. The first one is, you see it right there, if God is for us, who can be against us? In other words, if God is for us, who opposes us, and what is the answer to that question? That would be, that's right, no one. If God is on your side, is there anybody on the other side that really matters? Isn't. And our enemy opposes us, but to no avail, because it doesn't matter. It's like if you're up a group of three, third grader boys and you're picking teams for basketball and you got all these people to pick from and right over here is Shaq. <laughs> and one kid says, I choose him. And the rest of the other team's like, that's it. We, we ain't playing. This ain't working. Because if Shaq's on your team, I don't care how old the man is, he's still taller than a third grader, bigger than a third grader, and stronger than a third grader. If Shaq's on your team, doesn't really matter if you know how to play basketball. Just give the man the ball and just sit down and eat popcorn. He can take on the whole team. If God is for you, who can be against you? You literally doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's on the other side. It doesn't matter who's on the other team because God is on your side. So who can oppose you? Who can fight against you? That doesn't mean they won't stop fighting, but it doesn't mean what it means is that they're never going to win. Because he says here, and these are all rhetorical questions, by the way, because he knows the answer, and he knows we know the answer. He says, if God is for us, who's against us? And he says, if God has spared his own son but offered him up, how we will not grant us everything. In other words, if God gave his own son for us, what else would he not give for us? I mean, if God literally sacrificed his own son, what else would he give? What, what else would, he, would God ever say no to his people? For a true need, would God ever say no to his people? Absolutely not. Because he's a good, good father. We sang that last Father's Day. I think Miss Barry sang that. He's a good, good father. And would he not give us everything? He's a good dad. He takes care of his own. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, he's granted us everything. Christ's death on the cross paid our sin debt and made us part of the family. We literally joined the team with Shaq on it. 
We literally joined the team. When we joined God's team, we have the undefeated, unconquered God of the creator of the universe on our side. And nobody, but nobody has ever defeated him or ever will. And the creator, the one who made everything we see, is on our side. He's over here. And it doesn't matter who's over there. doesn't matter what's over there. He said, if God, can, if God is for us, who can oppose us? And the answer is, of course, nobody. But I think sometimes we forget that, don't we, church? Sometimes, sometimes we forget we don't win, we're on the winning team. Don't, can I get a amen on that one? Sometimes we forget we're on the winning team. Because life sometimes just constantly throws us losses, right? You know, it's, it's, it, you know when, a, when, a, when, a, when a ball team, you know, is in, in, a, in a drought, you know, they've lost 10 in a row, 12 in a row, 15 in a row, 20 in a row. You know, uh, when they finally get the win, it's like, I don't know what that feels like. It feels good. <laughs> yeah. You know, they could, and for a long time, it takes them forever to get that win because they don't know how to win because they've been losing all this time. They don't know how to win. They don't know what it looks like. They don't know what victory looks like because it's been a constant loss. But when they finally get the W, it's like, wow, that's what winning feels like. I want more of that. And that's why, you know, oh, now they felt like a win feels like. And when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you, you just change teams. You went from the team that's over whatever <laughs> to the winning team. He, you're on the winning team. It doesn't matter who else is on the other side. They can have they can have Shaq if they want. They can have Tom Brady if they want. I don't care who it is. You can, it don't matter who's on the other side because God's on our side. You know, it's like a third grade boy saying, "It don't matter if I can play ball. He can. It don't. That's all that matters." I don't even have to show up. You see, the reality is that what Christ did on the cross, it showed us that we can have victory because we are saved through his sacrifice. You've been made part, and I've been made part of the team that will never, ever, ever be defeated. And you might be thinking, wait a minute, preacher. Sometimes we do get defeated. Ah, hold on. Hold on to that thought. Fasten your seatbelt. We're going to get to that. Look what he says in verse 32, how we will not grant us everything. The sacrifice of Christ, it literally was the one thing that enabled us to be in the family of God through salvation. But look what he says in verses 33 to 34. He brings another question. Look what it says. Who can bring an accusation against God to let? Basically what that means is who can accuse God's people? There's that question. Here you go. Who can accuse God's people? What's the answer to that? Nobody. No, oh, wait a minute. Don't we have don't we have somebody that's always accusing us? Don't we already have don't we have somebody that's always accusing us? Yeah, that would be, yeah, we know who he is. We don't we don't even need to say his name. We know who he is. He's he's always accusing God's elect because we saw that. We see we saw we saw that in Job, right? Remember he was saying he was he was in God's praise accusing Job. And, Job, and God's like, Job's my man, Job's awesome. And he said, You just you just take your hand off of and see what happens, right? And we saw throughout the book of Job, what Job do? He never once cursed God. He stood strong no matter what happened. Stood strong. He said, who can accuse God's people? See, verse 33 and verse 34, we, we got, these, are, these are judicial terms. These are terms of a court. But look at it. It says, who can bring an accusation against God's elect? It's basically somebody arrested you, and now you're on trial. You're going to be guilty or not guilty. And God is the judge. If you stand before God, and, and, and now all your sins are dropped right there in front of the judge, and, and, and the enemy says, look at all that sin. Look at all that sin. They are as guilty as ever. Look at all that sin. And then, and then somebody comes up, and he says, uh, I'm taking care of that already. I've taken care of all this already. It's all, it's all me. And that man is Jesus. And God looks at you and says, that's right. You ain't guilty. No more. You see, the God man Jesus took our sin. See, he says here, verse 33, God is the one who justifies. What's that word justifies? We looked at that and saw that a couple weeks ago. Justified. He makes us and puts us in a position where we're not Guilty. God looks at us and he doesn't see our sin. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. And because he sees the blood, he says, not guilty. But sometimes we still feel guilty, don't we? 
because we still sin. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, it doesn't matter. The blood takes care of it. The blood has taken care of all of it. He says, who's the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. And he's at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. He talks about this word condemned. That word literally, word literally means to declare guilty. You see, believers cannot be found guilty because, and, we, and, and Paul he lays it all out here, because one, Christ's sacrifice paid for our sin. He took our consequence and he and took our punishment. You don't have to suffer for that sin because Jesus already did that. Amen? Jesus has already suffered and died for your and my sin. He's already taken the consequence, the punishment. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death, which means because we sin, we die. That's right in the scripture, Romans, earlier passage. But because what Jesus did, he took the wages of our sin. He took the death and he did it himself. He died on the cross for us and took care of that. We are not condemned because of what Jesus did on the cross. He took our consequence and our punishment, but also Christ's resurrection to be the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death. And because of sin, we die. Do you realize that's why we die, right? It's not because of cancer, not because of old age. It's not because of anything else. We die because of sin. Sin is what kills the physical, kills the body. Because the Adam and Eve were told, if you eat of that fruit, you will die. And what they do? They ate and they died. And guess what? From now on, because we are descendants of Adam, we are we carry that sin. We were born with it. And now, what happens? We are born, and then we, we die. The body dies, but, hold on. The, because Jesus got out of that grave, it shows that we're going to get out of our grave, too. Jesus didn't stay dead, and you and I aren't going to stay dead. Our bodies aren't going to stay in the ground. Even though when we die, what does the body say? Absent from the body is present with the Lord. And so for a believer, what does that mean? Death has got no fear over us. There's nothing over us. What's that phrase over in Corinthians? Paul said, oh, death, where is thy sting? Where is thing? Death, where is your victory? There ain't no victory because Christ's resurrection is take care of that problem. Because one day, we're going to be meeting Jesus Christ. And death might separate us from those here, but buddy, it reunites us with those there. And while it's not fun to talk about that subject, buddy, it's a home going and the first person we lay eyes on in glory is going to be our Savior. First person we lay eyes on, buddy. I, I, I tell you, I believe that's what John 14 was talking about when Jesus said, I'm coming, to, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to get you. I ain't going to be no angel coming to get me. My, my Savior's coming to get me. That's what I believe. You see, Jesus' resurrection from the grave guarantees us that we're going to get out of that grave. The Bible says we're going to get brand new bodies. Now, when, that, when that's going to take place in the, scheme of, uh, in the scheme of when God wraps up history, I don't know. But at some point in God's, in God's plan, we are getting resurrected bodies, a serious upgrade on what we got right now. Amen? Serious upgrade. I don't care what you drive right now on a Chevy. You got a Chevy right here with some, got some rust marks over here. You know, some paint space back here. You know, I'm driving, if you drive a Chevy, I'm sorry. No pun intended. It's just, it's just what came out. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But when you get to glory, buddy, you, you, you get a brand new ride. And ain't nothing that we're going to mess that up. Because it's going to be upgraded in the resurrected body. It's going to be just like Jesus had when he came out of the grave. It's going to be. It's going to The Bible is very clear. We're going to have a glorified body. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. See, a resurrection, his resurrection defeated the penalty of sin. But he says Christ is also exalted with the Father. Look what it says. He's at the right hand of God. What does that mean? He's got full authority as king. Jesus not only died, he not only rose again, but now he's exalted. And he's with the Father right now. Right now. He's with the Father. He's king. He's got, he's got full authority. Scripture says that everything is under his feet. Everything is under his power. Everything. And that's everything. 
Every single thing that you could think of is under the authority of Jesus Christ. Everything. I don't know about you, but that should make you feel good. Everything. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He is exalted. But also it says, look what he says. He is, he's an intercedes for us. Christ's intercession for his people continues daily. Do you know God the Father is listening to God the Son talk to him about you? How about them apples, right? Earlier Paul says the Holy Spirit prays when we don't know how to get the words out. He helps us when we're stuttering and trying to figure out what to say. But, but the son is right there in the father's ear saying, my child needs this, and my child needs that, and I need you to help him. He's constantly in the father's ear saying, my, my child needs you right now. How about them apples, buddy? Can he, is it getting better than that? It doesn't get no better than that. He is not only, but he only died for our sins. He rose, he rose from the grave to take care of that penalty of sin. He's, in, he's now a king of kings and lord of lords. And now he's making an intercession for us, and he does that every single day. That's what he does, and he's doing it right now. He's doing it right now. You see, the enemy is always going to accuse us because that's what he does. Has the enemy ever accused you of stuff? By the way, has he ever accused you of stuff that you, uh, you already asked forgiveness for? You know, you went to, you, you, you sinned against God, and God revealed it to you through the Spirit, and, and you like you, you got convicted of your sin, and then you repented of your sin. You know what? I, you know, you turn from it. You, you ask, you confess, and you repent. You say, God, I don't want to do that more. God, forgive me my sin. And you know what God does when we ask for forgiveness, right? He forgives us, and He makes it as far as the east is from the west, and it's gone. But the enemy likes to remind us of that sin, doesn't he? He likes to well go in and say, Hey, remember when you said this? Or remember when you did that? Right? Does he do that? He likes to bring stuff up, right? He loves to bring up our past. Well, I'm going to use an old cliche here. He, when he brings up your past, you bring up his future. Because you know what that is, right? He's on the hot seat, put it lightly. <laughs> okay? You just tell him it's been forgiven. That's forgiven. That's all water under the bridge. It's done. The thought of God the Father doesn't even remember it anymore. So why should I even acknowledge you? So when the accuser comes, and he will, you just tell him. It don't matter what you say because it's already been handled. You see, we are sealed as Christ's family and the family of God through the resurrection of Christ. You see, that enemy is going to accuse us, but it doesn't matter because the wrath of the God's wrath against sin has been satisfied with what Jesus did on the cross. Sin must be punished, but Jesus took care of that problem. His resurrection seals our salvation and ensures our not guilty verdict for our sin. He literally says they are not guilty and we're done. Case dismissed. <clears throat> How about that? What better feeling is that, right? I mean, God says you're not guilty. I don't care what you did. My son's already taking care of that problem. Man, and you've been sealed because of that. Because of that, you, your salvation has been sealed. Look at what he says in verses 35 to 39. But it's just stuff's just getting better and better and better. He throws out this third question. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Another rhetorical question, and you already know the answer today, don't you, church? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? No one. No one. And Paul gives us a little clarification. You see, you have to ask yourself, well, what about the bad stuff? Can the bad stuff separate us from the love of God? You know, we was talking this morning at Sunday school how we come in and it's all cloudy outside and stuff. You know, how we knew the sun's out there, but we can't see the sun because of the clouds, you know? We, you know, you know, y'all what I'm saying, right? Just a simple weather thing. And sometimes we can't see the sun because stuff's getting in the way. Life gets in the way, right? Sometimes life and the circumstances of life it keeps us from seeing the sun. But the sun's still there. Just because you can't see it don't mean he ain't there. He is always there. And just because stuff gets in the way doesn't mean he ain't there. Today, we can't see the physical sun. But it's up there. Probably by this afternoon, we'll get a glimpse of it, hopefully. But it's, but it's still there. And we know that because science, right? <laughs> but just because you can't see the sun today, S-O-N, doesn't mean he ain't there. Just because you don't feel him today doesn't mean he ain't there. Because he's just as real and more real than the physically created star that we get our life from. Paul shares here, this, he says, this is a, he says, he talks about this bad stuff, he's, and he goes down this list here. You know, it's a, you know, here's a, here's a sobering reality. 
Just think about this for a second. Think about this. Suffering, this is a true statement, suffering is woven into the Christian's life. You don't want to say about woven, right? It's kind of like your stuff kind of put together like clothes, right? Suffering is woven into the Christian's life. How many of you, when you got saved, thought, well, okay, that's it. No more pain, no more sorrow, and this is all good, and, and I don't have to worry about any bad thing happening ever again? Okay, nobody thought that, right? If you were told that, I'm sorry, you got sold a bill of good, that is not salvation. But how many of you thought, you know, that when I got saved, all this bad stuff's going to happen and nobody's going to be looking out for me? That ain't true either. You see, suffering is a part of the Christian life. It's, it's part of our makeup. And matter of fact, Jesus says in this life, you're going to have trouble. Jesus actually said that. He says, if they persecuted me, why won't they persecute you? By the way, if you're not going through persecution or you're not going through a bunch of bad stuff, my question is, hold on. Actually, that's not a question. It's a statement. You better hold on because it's probably coming. And the more you get closer to Jesus, the more that stuff happens. You ever notice that connection? The closer you get to Jesus, the more stuff happens, right? Because the enemy don't want you anywhere near to save you. But I'm here to tell you, cling to him. Look at this list here. Paul gives us this list in verse 35. And this is, a, this is an ascending list. This is an ascending order from the easiest to deal with to the most difficult to deal with. Affliction. This is everyday trouble. Bad day. How many of y'all had a bad day? How many of y'all had a bad day last week? Some of y'all had a bad day last week, right? Guess what? It's gone. No more. That bad day's gone. It's history. You're not going to see it again. Some of you are like, praise God, right? I want to see that again, right? Some of us, we have bad days. Paul starts when he's talking about affliction. It's everyday trouble. And all of us deal with it. Then he goes into anguish. You know what anguish is? That's just distress and anxiety. Distress and anxiety. Sometimes those bad days get worse, right? And distress and anxiety become part of it. We get anxious. Even though the Bible says don't be anxious, we still get anxious, right? The Bible says don't get stressed out, we get stressed out. The Bible says what are you worried about, we worry, right? Come on, can I get a witness? The Bible says don't do it, we still do it. Why is that? Because we, because we, because we, we're, we're human, but also because we're, 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 our eyes are on our troubles and our eyes are not on the Savior. Distress and anxiety, anguish. He says, can, he said, can affliction or anguish? Then he says, persecution. Persecution, what is that? Verbal and, that's the verse of verbal or physical, personal attacks due to faith in Christ. You ever been persecuted for your faith, church? You ever been ridiculed, made fun of for, for, for being a child of God? If you've never, ever, ever been ridiculed for your faith, you are, you are one of the few. And a lot of our brothers and sisters around the world deal with this every single day. American Christians, we, we, I'll just be honest with you, we're soft. We're soft. We're soft. I mean, we're sitting here, we got an air, air conditioned or heated room, sitting on padded pews and, and with windows and, and, and a nice sanctuary, right? And most churches around the world don't look nothing like this. You haven't been to them. I've been to a few of them, okay? A lot of them are just clean tos and there ain't no place to sit, and there ain't no air conditioning, there ain't no heat, and they got to deal with mosquitoes. But they still show up. <laughs> Why? Because it's the best part of the week, getting with God's people. You know, I mean, you know, I posted something on Facebook today. It said, you know, <laughs> yeah, if I remember this correctly, people don't go to church. People are the church. That's People are the church. People don't go to church. People gather as the church. There's a difference there. Persecution. When persecution comes, and it will, who's going to be there for you? He will. He never lets his people down. Then he says famine. Famine, what is this? This signifies a severe lack of a true need. It doesn't matter. That need can be physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual. There's a true need, and there's a big-time lack. In other words, you are suffering under something. You, you, you need something, and you're not getting it. You ever been there? Something you really need, and you're not getting it. Does God know what your needs are? You better believe he knows what your needs are. Look, this continues. He talks about nakedness. This is where that severe lack that he was just talking about now gets added to personal shame and embarrassment because of the need. You ever been, you ever been shamed or embarrassed because of something you needed and you want to talk about? Yeah? 
Nakedness is what basically it exposes everything. It lets everybody see who you really are. And some folks don't want that because we don't want to be transparent and we don't want to be, we, we don't want to let everybody see our stuff, right? We don't want anybody to see that we're going through stuff. We don't want anybody to see whether we're vulnerable. But when we're vulnerable, it's where we're closest to Jesus Christ. God wants us to be vulnerable with him. And so when he talks about vulnerability, he says, you know, with family, he says the nakedness, we're just, you know, we're vulnerable. And when we're vulnerable, that's when we look to Jesus. Amen? He talks about danger. This is personal threats of violence, possible harm. And then he eventually gets to the sword. This is a threat that becomes reality. A loss of life could be imminent. Do you see how this is a list that's progressing? Some of us experience some of this stuff. Ain't nobody here experienced the sword. None of us have. It. Have you had your life threatened lately? Jesus Christ? Is, have you, has your life ever been threatened because of your faith in Jesus Christ? I don't think anybody here has ever had their life threatened over that. But Paul shares this list. He said, can affliction, anguish, persecution, famine, nakedness, the danger of sword? And the answer to that question is, no. None of this. He says, look what he says. Now, this is written, verse 36. Because of you, we are put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Boy, that doesn't sound fun, does it? We're like sheep going to the slaughterhouse. Boy, is anybody, anybody ready to step up? Hey, yeah, let, me, let me be first in line on that one, right? I don't think anybody wants to do that, Right? Nobody wants to think about, I'm, I'm a sheep going to be slaughtered. But isn't that what Jesus did? He went as the Lamb of God, and the Bible says he didn't even open his mouth. And yet he went anyway and gave up his life for us. Look at, and Paul answers that question himself, verse 39. No, in all these things we are more than victorious through him who loved us. Basically that word literally means we're like super conquerors. We're like not just conquerors, we're super conquerors. Maybe we can get a t-shirt that says that. Super conquerors. You know, we can, we can, we're more than victorious. We're not just, we just don't have victory. We got all the victory. Because of what Jesus did, we have victory in Jesus. But I come up, I was trying to come up with a sermon title for this. I couldn't think of nothing but that song title, Victory in Jesus, because that's what this passage talks about. We have victory in Jesus. He says here, we're more than victorious through him who loved us. You know, God's always looking out for his people, isn't he? God's always watching over his people. Sometimes we don't even recognize it. Listen to this, this story as we get ready to wrap this up. Certain Native American tribes had a rite of passage for teenage boys. At thir age 13, a boy would be blindfolded and led to a certain spot in the woods. He would be forced to sit down while the men of the tribe returned to their camp. The boy would be required to sit all night with his blindfold in place. He was forced to listen to the frightening sounds of the night. Once he felt the warmth of the sun as it rose to the east, in the east, he was allowed to remove his blindfold. The first thing he saw when he removed it was his father sitting across from him. The boy's father would sit with him all night, protecting him from the animals of the wilderness, yet he was never seen by his son. And that's exactly what God does for us. We don't often see him, but he's the one that's there protecting us, even though we can't see his protection. Our salvation is secure in the Father's hands. We're secure because of what Christ did for us and his love for us. Amen? We're secure. And then Paul lists, as he's wrapping this up, he said, things that cannot separate us from the love of God. Look what he says. And you see all this list there in verse 38. He says, for I'm persuaded. Which means he said, you know what? I know this. This is true. He says, death. You know, death doesn't separate us. Death reunites us with the Father. You recognize that? Sometimes we forget that. It reunites us with the Father. He says life, the stuff of life, doesn't matter what kind of stuff that is, it serves to push us into the loving arms of the Father. When stuff gets bad, where do you go? You should be running to the arms of Jesus. That's what I do. He said death can't do it, life can't do it, angels can't do it. It doesn't matter whether it's God's angels or fallen angels. It doesn't matter who they are, although they're powerful. Even they can't get between us and the Father. Do you recognize that? It doesn't matter. They cannot get between us. He says rulers or powers. It doesn't matter what, who, what human being, or no matter how powerful they are, they don't have the power to get between us and him. He says that then he goes into the present. What's going on in our life right now may feel horrible, but it's not enough to push God away from us. God is ever present in our lives. Amen? 
There's a statement that says, when everybody else walks out on us, God walks in. And that's it. But here's the thing. That's a great statement, but it's actually a little bit untrue. God never, God never left to walk in. God's always been there the whole time. He ain't never left us because the scripture says he ain't going to leave us. So it doesn't matter what you're going on through right now. It doesn't matter how bad life feels. It doesn't matter because it's not enough to get between you and them. He says the future. We don't know the future, but we know the one who's in there in the future, right? God the Father is already in the future. He exists outside of time, so our future is his present. You see, God has no past. God has no future. That's why his name is I Am. Not I was or I will be. Because there ain't no past or pre past or future with him. He's his his he's present right now, and he's present in the future, our future. Right now. He knows everything about us. He knows, he knows everything. He knows what's what you're gonna do today. He knows what you're not gonna do today. Okay. He knows he knows what you're gonna have for lunch. He knows. <laughs> He knows if you're going to speed trying to get lunch. Hopefully not. He knows all this stuff. See, God exists outside of time. And, 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 he, and there is no future with him. So because of that, everything is present. God is already in our future. Can you just hold on to that right now? So even though you don't know the future, and I don't, is our God already there? Yeah, he is. And then he talks about powers again. It doesn't matter if it's supernatural or earth. It doesn't matter. God's love is ever with us. And he says, hi, is there any place too high for God? Is there any place too high for God? No. God is there. Depth. Is there any place too low for God? No. God is there. And he says, any earthly thing. In case Paul, Paul's like, just in case I missed anything in the list, if it's a created thing, it can't. Oh, by the way, is there anything that's not created? There's one. That's God himself. Because God has always been, and God has always, God will always will be. Everything else has been created. So he says, any created thing, nothing, can get between us and the loving arms of the Father. Literally, our eternity is secure in Christ. Nothing, he, the question is, who can separate us from the love of God? And it goes down this list. But you know what? Sometimes, sometimes our stuff doesn't make its list, right? You know, can an illness separate you from the love of God? Can a divorce separate you from the love of God? Can COVID separate you from the love of God? Can a family problem separate you from the love of God? Can a fight with family separate you from the love of God? Can age separate you from the love of God? Can money separate you from the love of God? Well, y'all know the answer to this, but it sounds really redundant. There's, there's nothing at all that can separate you from the love of the Heavenly Father for His children. But if you can't, if this passage of Scripture doesn't give you chill bumps, I don't know, maybe you want to check your pulse. Because this is what they call the good stuff. God says right here, and Paul says right through, through God says through Paul, Nothing's going to get between you and him because our eternity is secure. This whole pastor's talking about because of what God has done through Jesus Christ. We are secure in the Father, and our Savior is looking out for us, always watching over us, and always with us. There is nothing that can oppose us, nothing can be against us, and nothing that can separate us. It's bad English, but it's certainly good theology. Amen? Nothing gets between you and him. Church, sometimes we need that reminder. Because many of us, we walk in the doors here. Many of us live through life. And, buddy, we, we, we act as if God is distant. But I'm going to tell you something. God is never distant. He sometimes feels distant. Doesn't. But, you know, here's the thing. Salvation is not a feeling. If salvation was a feeling, I'd have been lost a long time ago. I'm just being honest because sometimes I don't feel safe. But it doesn't matter what I feel. It matters what I know. I've been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and I'm his child. And because of that, it doesn't matter how I feel. It only matters what I know. And I know that I'm in the Father's hands, because the Scripture says so. And our eternity is secure. We are there. There's nothing that can separate us from him. 
I don't care what's on your list. Maybe you've got other stuff that I didn't name. But I'm going to tell you, the answer is still the same. Nothing gets between you and the Father. I don't know about you. That should encourage you. That should encourage you today. That's a, as they say in the South, crank your tracker. Now, that should crank your tracker. That should get you going. You should Because you, you have victory in Jesus today, church. We have victory in Jesus because of what he did, what Jesus did on the cross. We've been declared not guilty. We're his child. And now because of that, we've been bought and paid for. And we have we are secure in our salvation. And nobody and nothing can touch us and separate us from his great love. Amen? God loves us. And don't ever forget that. Father God, they, I, Lord, I pray that you'd remind us today. Lord, hopefully we've already been reminded. Lord, that you love us so much. God, you love us so much. And sometimes, Father, we just don't we just don't recognize that love. Sometimes, Father, we we simply just forget that you love us. And Father, Lord, today, Lord, we might have come in here today, Lord, uh, dealing with some stuff, Father. We might have come in here today, and Father, we might actually come in and felt defeated in some area. Lord, I know I did on some degree, but Father, I know the Scripture is very true. Father, ain't nothing. That, there's nobody can oppose us. Father, there's nobody that there's nobody can accuse us, and there's nobody can get in your way, get between us, because your word is never ever untrue. Father God, you, I thank you for this reminder today. Doesn't matter what, what comes up against us. Doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Father, doesn't matter what life or death throws at us. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Father, nothing gets between you and us. And Father, today, a lot of us got clouds. Father, we got clouds that's keeping us from seeing you. Father, that day I pray that you remove those clouds and allow us to see you. Help us, Father, and remind us, Father, even though those clouds might be there. And Father, you allow those clouds to remain sometime. Father, help us to be mindful. Father, it doesn't matter if we can't see you. You're still there. You're always there. So, Father, today I pray that as, we, as we've been reminded that we have victory in Jesus, Lord, today I pray that you'd encourage us with these truths. Father, nothing gets between us and you because we are your children and you love us so. Thank you, Father, for that reminder. Lord, I pray that there's somebody here today, Father, that does not know what I'm talking about, Father, because they've never, ever given their life to Jesus Christ. Father, they never, ever have surrendered to you, Father. They never asked for forgiveness of sin. Father, they've never trusted in what Jesus did on the cross. Lord, I pray today be the day where they can be adopted into your family. Father, maybe today there's others in this congregation, Father, that you've been talking to about doing something. Father, I don't know what that is, Father. But, Father, if you, if you, if you have told, them, told anybody here, Lord, to do something, Lord, I pray that you'd help them to be obedient, whatever that is. Father God, this is a time of decision. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to be faithful in that decision. Father, as we come to this time of invitation, Lord, I pray that you'd encourage us to follow you always. And ask us in Jesus' name.